Okay, welcome everyone. My name is Adam Greco, and I'm with Search Discovery and help manage the SDEC. Uh, many of you already know the drill here, but this is a weekly uh, group that meets and provides free educational classes for things related to digital marketing and digital analytics. During today's session, if you have any technical issues or issues are related to the SDEC, um, you can ping me on the chat and I will be there to help you. If you have any questions for our presenter, Jamarius, uh, please use the Zoom Q&A and we will get to those at the end of the session. Today's session is in the area related to Google Analytics. And um, that's really it. So I'm going to hand it off to Jamarius. Jamarius, thanks so much for presenting, and I will let you take it away. All right. Hello, everybody. I'm Jamarius Taylor, uh, Senior Associate Data Science here at Search Discovery. And we're going to be talking about market basket analysis with the Google Analytics API. So. Let's first talk about what the market basket analysis is. It actually uses an algorithm called a priori that does associated rules learning. So what associated rules learning is, it just, it just seeks to find patterns inside of data. In particular, we're gonna be working with e-commerce data here. So it's just saying, what interesting if this, then that patterns do we see? So a few examples of this in our everyday life would be if we have you know, a store and if a person buys a pencil, then they're probably also likely to buy paper. Um, but these rules, uh, this rule, that rule goes both ways. If you buy paper, then you might also buy pencils. But some of these rules don't go both ways. So another interesting one is if a person buys sheet music, they're likely to buy chapstick. If you're a musician, then you know that, you know, buying sheet, buying chapstick to keep your, you know, lips fresh and things as you play makes a lot of sense, but every time you buy chapstick, there's no reason for you to go out and buy a brand new piece of sheet music, especially if you're not a musician. So this one goes only one way, where X is likely to lead to Y, but Y is not likely to lead back to X. And then finally, there are some times where these items are actually seen as opposites or supplements of each other. So if a person were to buy almond milk because of the lactose intolerance, um, and they're probably not likely to buy cow's milk because these two goods um, are opposites of each other or replacements for each other. So that's what we're trying to gain from today um, from that. So primary uses of this, uh, we can actually use it for a, a few different things. Um, of course, uh, recommender systems is the biggest one. Uh, what, what are you more likely to buy? Categorization of customers. What kind of customer are you based off of the set of things that you buy? So if you buy only organic, um, vegetables from this store, then maybe you are in the vegetarian group because um, we have never seen you purchase meat. Uh, categorization um, of the items that are based on purchases, so loop, lumping in together um, items that are likely to be bought together, so maybe you want to put them uh, side by side for each, uh, from each other. Uh, data dimension and reduction and also fraud detection. Those last two are least likely, but there's still um, some pretty uh, interesting use cases out there for market basket of these. But today, uh, our use case here is we're going to have a large data set full of transactions, and we're going to have that transaction. We can also have it by day if we'd like, and we'd like to gain knowledge of, of the products that are being purchased together there, and maybe even find out what products uh, are likely to be bought together and what products might be substituted. Other. If you like, we're actually going to go to R and we're going to go to the Google API. Hey, Jamarius, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, we're having a hard time hearing you. Um, I don't know if you can speak closer to the computer you're at or if you have headphones, yeah. but it's a little bit hard to hear you. Yep. Um, can you hear me any better now? Yeah, that's much better. Thank you. Okay. So much. Yep, no problem. Sorry about that, folks. All right, so we are um, we're now in R, and we're going to take a look at the Google Analytics API to grab some of this data. So what we've done here is we've gone through, we've authenticated, um, and working with that is pretty simple. I'm actually going to um, we've gone through and authenticated. I'm not going to run any of this code live because I've uh, been burned before. But we've gone through, we've got a list of all of our accounts that we have access to. We've then gotten the GAID for those accounts. 
And then we've run this query here. This query just says, can I have a month's worth of data from the, for the month of January? We're gonna grab the item quantity because that's what, that's what comes back from GA and the item revenue. This isn't necessarily needed for this example, but you probably will later on come back and ask to have questions around revenue, um, such as how much revenue can we expect to gain if X amount of customers that we recommend things by uh, the, do the, have the, the cross sell opportunity. Um, then we also need the product name and we also need the transaction ID. Uh, the transaction ID here is actually uh, very important because it's what makes each individual basket unique. A great part about market basket analysis is that it actually strips away a lot of the standard PII that we would have to get from kind of uh, web analytics data. We don't really care who you are. Uh, we don't need to know where you're from, any of that information. All we need to know is what was inside of the basket. And so that's actually a huge benefit to us. So what we've done now is we've come through and we've bought a bunch of, we have a bunch of different things, but as you can see, each of those has an item quantity, but it needs to be unraveled uh, because each row uh, is not an individual um, set of purchases. So what we've done here is we've gone through and we're going to come in and ask, what is the maximum number of items in a cart? just because we need to know how many items are in there. Um, and we'll need that number for later. Next, we're gonna come in and we're going to use, uh, we're gonna first take the item revenue and divide it by the item quantity. That'll give us an individual unit price. Once again, for this example, we won't need that, but you will have questions, of course, about revenue and you wanna make sure you get the numbers right. R has a function in it called uncount that just takes a row, uh, a, a numeric row, and it will then make duplicate rows of that row for whatever that number is there and it's called uncount and it's really what's doing the heavy lifting here so what we're actually going to do is we're going to take that item quantity and we're going to make a new row for each item quantity so that each one is one so we've done that now and so now you see we've gotten rid of the quantity uh column because each one of these is one of the quantities uh, next, we're going to take the, the, the individual items and we're going to say if you are inside of one single transaction, then what I would like to do is I'd like to take those and put them into one comma separated list as one column. And so we'll do that here. Um, and as it runs, basically what's going to happen is that each one of these gift certificates uh, for this person is going to be a, a column. And then it's also going to reduce them so that there are only uniques inside of each of these columns. Uh, and so while we wait for that, I will move on to kind of what this next piece of code does because it takes a, a bit of, uh, of time. Actually, I'm going to run a bit of live code. And so then what we're going to come through and do at that point is we're going to take each of those columns and we're going to blow them out wider. So we want each column to be an individual item that was purchased, which is why at the very beginning, we went up and asked, what is the max number of items in a cart? Because we need to know what our widest cart is. What this will actually do for us now is it's going to then um, separate them out and then it's gonna fill in any uh, carts that aren't quite the same size as the largest one that we have. It's going to uh, fill those in with NAs. So that's finished running. So let's take a look at what it looks like now. Each transaction ID just has a val has has a, has a list of of everything that was purchased, and it's separated by commas. So now we'll take that and we will blow it out to a wider set. So now each of these is an item, and as you can see, each of them has been uh, filled with an NA. If we have just baskets that are that are are obscene and in size. We're actually going to write that out to a CSV and then we're going to come back to it. And I'm actually going to use a different data set when we come back because I think it'll be a bit more impactful. But that's the data we're into. Oftentimes with a lot of these data science projects and things that we do, most of the most of the work comes from the data running when getting all of the data into the correct shape to be able to push it into uh, whatever model we're going to use. And so uh, this market basket analysis is no different. And of course the code uh, will be available um, on GitHub or it is available on GitHub now. And I'll have that link at the end for everybody. Um, all right, so now we need to get some vocabulary here. Um, so let's do that. 
Uh, first uh, things first is a rule set. What is a rule set? It's often written as X uh, leads to Y. This just tells us what items we're observing and what items we expect to see someone purchase after that. So in the previous example we gave you, you have pencils lead to paper, sheet music leads to chapstick, almond milk leads to cow, cow's milk. Uh, even though this last one isn't likely, we still will get a, a set of, of parameters around that to say how likely it is, but this is what it'll look like. So this is what we're gonna be expecting to see. Um, ooh, that's a typo. Next we have support. Support, I don't I, no, I have a typo here, but it's actually going to be support. Support is just the percentage of transactions uh, that are contained there. Basically, count each time that a rule set. Um, rule sets can also have multiple X or left-hand side inputs. So just count each time that that set appears and then divide that by the total number of transactions. If you have a lot of products and you have a lot of transactions, that number is going to be pretty small. That's okay, that number is mostly ordinal and the size, uh, the actual number, even if it's gonna be a fraction or a small decimal, doesn't really matter uh, all that much. Confidence uh, is taking the support for when you see the items that you're looking for on the left and right hand side, divided by the support of the item on the left hand side. This basically will help us uh, control for items that might be very popular so we have to have a confidence So, how likely do we think we're going to see that just because we see an item often does not mean that we are likely to see its corresponding item. Um, or in English, this is just the count of every time, oops, sorry. In English, this is just the count of every time pencils and papers are purchased divided by the time every time we see pencils. Um, that way we're not conflating the popularity of pencils with paper. Uh, lift is going to be uh, basically a measure of likelihood that the uh, that that increases the the likeliness that an item is purchased. So, um, if we have a high lift, and that means that um, we expect to see when we see the left hand side, we expect to see more purchases on the right hand side than the right hand side would have gotten on its own. Um, and so this number is usually going to be more than one or less than one or somewhere around there, but one is kind of true center where if it's one, um, then it just, there's not really a relationship there. Though you can also get a negative lift and that could imply that the item is a replacement or a supplement for the other item. Uh, so the cow's milk and uh, goat milk example um, hold steady here. All right, so let's talk about applications. Uh, there's cross-sell, of course. So we can say, uh, if you bought one item, then we'd like to also sell you another item. There is also upsell by saying, hey, we saw that you bought this item, but we know that there's a, a higher supplemental or a higher replacement item that you might be more interested in um, because it's better. And then there's also content. Uh, content is very is a very interesting use case for this because if you think of it as if you have a, a website that has um, content on it, so you have articles and things, you can think of uh, of a user each time they visit a different web page with different content on it. It's them purchasing that content, even if you have it on your website for free, and then that just becomes a basket of goods. So now I can recommend to you that if you've read two pieces of content that I can then uh, recommend you a third piece of content based off of um, the same market basket analysis that we've done here. So that's a pretty, um, a pretty slick kind of uh, change in the way that we're looking at it, but it still works. So let's go back to R now. And let's actually get into the MBA. So as you can see here, we're in a different we're in a different data set. But the last, if you remember, the last thing that we did was we read out a bunch of items. I'm going to um, or write, wrote out a bunch of items. I'm going to read those items back in um, just to see them, and then we're actually going to work with uh, shopping cart data from Instacart that's available online. I think this is a bit more uh, universally um, known some of the items that we're talking about instead of some of the niche things that uh, we'd be working with. So we already have our list of items uh, that we've read back in through this read transaction, which is a part of the, um, uh, the uh, a priori package. Um, so we'd come in and we'd get a summary of items. This item set is actually very large. And so we're going to skip that and we're gonna draw an item frequency plot. This just says, what items are we seeing the most of here? 
so we have bananas, organic bananas, all the way to lawns and things. So as I said, this is shopping, literal shopping cart data from a grocery store. So these items should look very familiar. So then now we want to say, a priori, make us a set of rules. We can then also say, only sell us rules with certain support and confidence as you see here and here. Uh, once again, these numbers are very small, but that's okay because they're mostly ordinal. So then we have our list of rules and then I'd like to see all of my rules sorted by confidence. And then let's look at our number one rule. So our number one rule here says that, let me make this a bit um, bigger there, wider. So our number one rule basically here just states that if somebody is buying organic Haas avocados and they've also bought organic navel oranges, they're probably likely to buy a bag of organic bananas. Um, we have our support and our confidence here. Um, don't worry about the coverage there. But again, it's very small numbers, but that's okay. We see that this has happened 132 times and that it has a lift of 4.53. Um, that is a great lift. That means that uh, we're, we're, it's above one. So that means that we're more likely to see purchases of, or of bananas uh, from this rule set. So next, uh, what we're gonna wanna do is after we have all those rules, we're gonna have to implement this somehow. And this kind of gets into the feeling of recommender systems. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take these rules here, and we're just gonna make a data frame um, out of them called data frame of rules that has all of our left-hand side, our right-hand side, our support, confidence, lift, and our count. We will then come back and we were gonna, we're gonna drop coverage here. And what's important is we're actually going to filter out, sometimes you have blank rules. We're just gonna filter those out that have a blank left-hand side. And we're actually gonna rescale these from one to 100, only our support and confidence. You do not want to rescale your lift because uh, that will come off as misleading. But these, since they're already ordinal, now we can see 100 is going to be our, the rule that we're most, com the rules that we're most confident in and one are gonna be the ones that we're least confident in. The same goes for support. This is gonna make it a lot easier to take it to a stakeholder or someone and say, hey, this is what we believe is happening. Finally, we're gonna go in, we're gonna break away some of these brackets that uh, are, are naturally built by the algorithm. And we're gonna create this function here that called recommender. Basically what it's going to do is it's going to take our rule set and it's going to take a focus of some sort that we care about and we're going to take it and we're gonna filter down to it. We're gonna get our top 10, um, our top 10 results based on lift. So we have that function that exists. We're gonna come down through here and let's take uh, limes, looks like a good one down there. And we're going to ask the recommender. So if we have limes, then they recommend that they, based off of uh, the, the criteria, we recommend that you buy lemons, makes sense, lemons and limes, cilantro, red onions, garlics, garlic, uh, jalapeno, cilantro again, more garlic, but this time not organic, ginger root and black beans. All of these things sound like ingredients for either cooking or possibly making cocktails. And so you can see kind of how this situation or how this uh, algorithm works. So what can we do with that? Uh, at the end of the day uh, or ever, overnight, we can then say who's purchased something from us and then we can maybe blast out a coupon or some sort and say, hey, would you like to come back to our store to buy this because we've seen you buy something else. We can do it in a more real-time fashion. If you've ever been on amazon.com or something and you start putting uh, things into the cart and then it starts to recommend things that also go with that. So if you buy a brand new iPad, then it might recommend an Apple Pencil because those two items are generally bought together. So as you can see, we have a bunch of different options for what we're going to do um, once we have this information there. All right, and so that brings us to the, uh, the end of my presentation. Um, once again, I'm Tamarius Taylor, Senior Associate uh, data science here at Search Discovery. Uh, all the code that you've seen here is available at GitHub. So if you check out this GitHub, I've also written about this topic before on LinkedIn. So if you uh, want to check that, check out more uh, musings about what we can do with market basket analysis, you can also see it there. If you have any questions about this, I'm on all the Slack channels, but you can also reach me at Twitter um, at, at Jamarius and Taylor. Okay.
thanks so much, Jamarius. Jamarius is a fast talker. Yeah, <laughs> so sorry about that. So you finished uh, 10 minutes early. because, <laughs> because oh, I thought I was behind. <laughs> so uh, cool. So if anyone has questions for Jamarius, uh, please uh, put them in the Q&A. Um, and let me see, uh, let's see, uh, Marianne has said, could you please place your links in the Q&A? Uh, thank you, Jamari. So I'm guessing she's asking if you can, uh, actually, if you can copy from your slide, um, either in the Q&A or in the chat, you could probably throw those links, just grab from GitHub down um, and throw it in either the Q&A or the chat. I think some people just want to save some typing time. <laughs> That I can do. Uh, you should see them coming through the chat right now. Okay. Uh, next, um, how would you first suggest people get familiar with using R? Uh, thank you for your time, Tamarius. Yeah. Um, the first steps, I think, getting used to using R is one, you need to find uh, just a, a, a simple enough use case. And then if you have, uh, depending on your background, if you have a programming background, then a lot of what you're doing in R, um, there's an equivalency for it in some of your other languages. So um, if you've seen, and I'll go back to it, if you've seen a lot of these, um, these pipes and things in this filter, these are actually all, these are called dplyr verbs, but they're based on SQL. So uh, filter would be the same as a where clause, a range would be the same as order. Um, mutate is kind of like the case statement of, the, of that world. So if, you, if you're coming from that sort of background, um, then as you begin to Google things, you can, you can literally Google the, the question that you're looking for if you know how to do it in one language and just type, pop in R at the very end, maybe put it in quotes so that Google makes sure to look looks for our examples and there'll be a, a whole set of folks that are also kind of jumping into that. If you're coming from a more of a different background, um, then once again, these verbs are, are very much like writing English. And so I would also uh, quite literally state what my problem is into Google. So if I have a data set and I'm looking to get rid of everything above a certain threshold, uh, Google's done a pretty good, will do a pretty good job of, again, showing you these dplyr verbs and it'll show you how to use filter. But that all that to be said, uh, I'd recommend checking out the tidyverse. So if you just Google our tidyverse, it'll get you, I think, on the right path. Okay, next question. Um, how many transactions would be a suitable amount for this approach? Um, there's not a, a set amount of transactions. So I say if you have over a, a hundred transactions, then you're probably uh, set. What I would recommend though, is that you don't want to have more products than transactions. And this kind of goes back to the idea of uh, you want to have, even though this algorithm doesn't have degrees of freedom necessarily, it goes back to that same idea where you don't want your data to be wider than it is deep. So as long as that's not the case, I think you can use this on um, any numbers, any set of transactions, probably over say a hundred. Okay. Um, assuming you have transactional data with customer ID, uh, not GA, are there any pitfalls to rolling up to customer level instead of order level to understand product ownership relationships? Um, depending on your store, you could run into an issue. So if you are Walmart, for instance, which is a large place that sells a ton of different items, then rolling up to the customer level, you might lose a lot of context because I can go to Walmart and buy a TV and a PlayStation and, and, um, and a video game. I can also go to Walmart and buy, you know, bananas, strawberries, and avocados. And so your correlations will start to get very spurious when you see that like folks that are buying avocados are also buying, you know, cocktail shaker sets. And, you know, that just might be a crime of opportunity that Walmart sells a bunch of things. But if you're a very niche place uh, that sells um, maybe one category of items, then rolling up to the customer level might actually bring you some insights uh, to maybe the customer comes back and because they've, purchase something and then realize they needed something else to bring it back. Um, so 
you, you, you do run that pitfall there if you sell too many items of rolling it up because your customers um, could be coming in for something different on any given day. Okay, next question. Um, I think you touched upon this, but someone had asked, have you used this for content? If not, would be a stretch to link article topics or individual, individual articles? Um, yeah, so when I first presented this internally um, to our community here, or internal data science community at SBI, it was actually about content to say, if you're looking for certain content, um, then this is kind of where you can, um, this, this is kind of where we would steer you to go to. Uh, it's, it's, not, it's not quite that, that large of a stretch. I would say that you want to keep it to content or products. Um, because once again, or maybe even job pages, but you want to make sure that the pages are um, linked together. Uh, because if they're not, then a website, you know, can be a huge place. And if your website has multiple things going on, then it might get out of hand. And also, if somebody visits too many, um, so many pages, it's going to blow out that 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 chart that we saw earlier that took some time to run, where we had to get each individual item. And that's just putting undue burden kind of on your, your systems. Okay, uh, next question, Javaris. Uh, have you tried to implement this script or the recommender in a live application, website or mobile app? Uh, could be a custom alternative to recommender system applications for small business. Okay, so uh, I've not used this specific um, for, for to do anything live. That being said, I've put together, um, I've put together uh, with, with actually the help of someone else uh, who just kind of saw my work online and, and, and did this as well. Uh, and I'll try to tweet out at them once I remember um, who I'm talking about. But basically, yes, what you can do to make this kind of uh, live is that everything you've done here in R, you can package it up in Docker. Um, once you package it up in Docker, you can send it straight to Google Cloud Run. Um, which will act as an endpoint. And so then very like then live on the page, we know what you've been uh, viewing and things of that nature. So if we see that you've put three things in your cart, then we can actually hit that endpoint to say, what's the fourth thing that we should be recommending them. And then from there, um, once, once the API just hits the endpoint and says, here's the, uh, here's the item, then you just render that on the screen for them. And it's pretty sna uh, pretty snappy thanks to, um, I mean, Google's doing most of the heavy lifting in that at that point. Hopefully okay. that answers the question. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think that covers all of our questions. So you were short and sweet. Um, oh, wait, actually, wait, hold on. One more quest, last question. Uh, is it correct to say that the recommendations depend on the accuracy of the rule set? Yes, um, just like with any uh, recommendation system, it has to be the accurate. So it's going to be dependent on that. Um, what we haven't done here, but what, what, would, what would be very interesting and what I would recommend people to do once they're extending this project is that not only are the rule sets important, but also the rule sets baked, broken out by day um, are very important and will give you a lot more accuracy if you're going to use this as a recommender system. So you want to put in a few more parameters such as day, maybe season, um, if you're doing this type of information for like a brick and mortar, then maybe your physical location also matters. And I say these things because uh, of the a big example of, of when associated rules have come into effect is that stores started finding out that on Fridays, uh, if somebody came in to buy beer, they were likely to also be, or diapers, they were also to be likely to buy beer. This, on, this rule only really held over the weekends. So if you have, you know, Friday through Sunday as weekend days, then it's going to be overshadowed by the other four days of the week that people are shopping. But when you break it out by day, you can find out that turns out it's just a lot of parents who don't want to have to leave the house this weekend too often. So they're buying the things that they need for their new child, as well as things for the weekend. So they can sit around, and watch, you know, whatever they're going to do that weekend. And then regionally, this uh, works out because if you've seen uh, if you've ever been to a college town, then you know that the ping pong balls are often sold next to the red solo cups, which you wouldn't normally do that in maybe a regular city, but in a college town, um, usually both of those items are being purchased together and the day of the week 
uh, likely doesn't really matter that much in a college town, but the day of the week might also, you might see an uptick on that uh, starting, you know, Thursday afternoon into the weekend. So yes, it does matter. Um, a, a few more things do matter to get you more accuracy and it will make your recommender more accurate. And then Eric asked a follow-up, could you then potentially use machine learning on analytics data to generate rule sets and feed it to your code? Sorry, say that last part again. I guess I'll uh, see. Uh, could you use machine learning on analytics data to generate rule sets and feed it to your code? Yes, you could. Um, again, extending this, um, keeping it short and sweet, but extending this uh, to, um, to to that, what you could what you would do after this is that once you have a set of rule sets, um, then you can uh, you can you can then start to 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 get into kind of an optimization mode of saying, okay, let's show this many people. Um, the 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 recommendation, and let's not show these people the recommendation to see kind of what your true return is there. And then for each rule set uh, becomes a row and the recommendation becomes a number. And then you can quickly regress on that based off of some other topics that you might also put in there by like day of the week, uh, category of the item, uh, location, anything like that. And then you can also do a regression on that to see one, how accurate are my rule sets and maybe this rule set is only accurate on Thursdays in the south and maybe this rule set is only accurate on Tuesdays in the on the west coast or something like that maybe time also plays a factor into what we're talking about here so yes you can extend it even further to then um, regress back onto that topic so if you you know really enjoy machine learning with your machine learning then that is a project for you okay Awesome. Okay. Well, thanks, uh, Jamarius, and thanks everyone for joining. Uh, we will see everyone again uh, next week uh, if you're coming to next week's session. So, Jamarius, thanks again so much. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me. Okay. Have a good week, everyone.